Ellie Sanderson is an award-winning bridal retailer. With stunning boutiques in Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, she is incredibly popular with brides who come to her not only to find the dress, but to have the ultimate experience of finding that dress. I caught up with her to find out how she started her business, how she grew it, and how she is adapting to the new normal in which we all find ourselves. Ellie, hi, it's lovely to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Good to see you. I'm back in my shop for the first time in three months. Oh, good. Let's I'm, have a look, please. Show I'm us a look. happy girl. Happy yeah. girl. Beautiful Beaconsfield. Lovely. Made me feel a little bit weepy to come back in today, but excited to see all my gorgeous collection again. Good. I bet. I bet. So for the benefit of those who don't know you, if there is anyone out there, um, give us a little sense of who you are and, and, and what it is you do. So I own two gorgeous wedding dress shops. I've been in business now for 11 years. Um, proud to be one of the first winners of the Wedding Industry Award all those years ago. Um, one of the shops is in Beaconsfield, one's in Woodstock, and we sell some of the best designers in the world, mostly British made dresses, um, Sassy Hole for Suzanne Neville, and I sell um, other designers as well, one called Hughes Fuero. So yeah, designer beautiful handmade to order gorgeous wedding dresses how did you come to start in the wedding industry it's not something that people dream of being involved with but how did you come to start yeah i am um, i have a corporate background um damien i've been in corporate retailing for about 20 years prior to having the shop um and i've worked for companies like marks and spencers tk max the pier Sainsbury's, all of them. Um, I've been a buyer, I've been a regional director. So always, always selling product and great product. I always enjoyed good product. And actually I did always dream of owning a wedding dress shop. <laughs> um, and I got to a point where I, oh God, I, my furniture had friction burns, traveling up and down the country with all these jobs, relocating to Ireland, Scotland, Wales. And, and I just thought, I'm done with this now. I need to settle down and do something else. And I got to such a senior position in some of those companies where I wasn't seeing the customers anymore. And that's a massive thing for me, my customers, my clients. And so I wanted a business where I could sell something that I absolutely loved, um, where I could pick product where you know the provenance of this product is so important to me and where I could look people in the eye and, and sell them a gorgeous product um, and yes I did have a scrapbook full of wedding dresses that I'd been drawing since I was about four and wedding wedding it was either going to be wedding dresses or interior design or funerals um, and and I chose wedding dresses which is a much more positive thing. So good to hear and and such a sort of unusual story in that you always dreamt of owning a, a, a wedding dress boutique or shop I mean that is unusual I think these days and you're right it takes a lot more work to run a business in our industry than than most people think um, mm -hmm. and I think that can sometimes take people by surprise and we'll come on to that later I hope. Um, Tell us a bit about your business right now. Who and what do you focus on particularly? My, my business has always been built on a number of key things um, and that's never really changed. Um, but obviously what's gone on recently, we've had to adjust what we do. But for me, um, the, my focus has always been about the people I employ. Um, I don't employ girls that have been in weddings for years and years and years. I employ wonderful girls that have great personalities that know how to connect with the customers. So it's all about people that work with me. And then it's, it's three P's. It's all about product. Um, so I spent a lot of time picking the designers that I work with. And I work with them because I know them personally. Um, I work with them because I know where the dresses are made. Um, I work with them because I go to where the dresses are made. And, you know, so product is massive. The provenance of my product is so important to me. Um, and then, you know, the third P for me is place. I always think it's important to have the most incredible place. So, you know, my shops are not wedding factories. They're little boutiques. It's all about one-to-one -one customer experience. Always has been, always will be. Um, the, when you come for your appointment here, it's only you and me or one of my girls. So it's a real one-to-one -one experience. So it's always been about the people I employ, the product that I sell, and the environment I sell it in. 
behind all of that, I'm utterly obsessed with processes and systems. And that doesn't mean you're processed in my business, but it means that you're safe and you're looked after and all the systems we have in place and the diligence that we have is just first class. Um, and I, I sound very arrogant in saying all that, but we get told it. And yeah, I do. I run the corner shop like a corporate business, but it, it means people can, when they buy a dress of me, they can sleep at night. So, so yeah, those things have always been the, 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 the core of everything that we do and still, and even more so nowadays when people need to trust you when they're making that purchase, you know, the fact that we've got, the longevity that we've got um, and the transparency and everything that we do is just so important. So, yeah, so that's always been key and always will be. Right. Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about the process. I think it's a, uh, it's the one thing, well, there's lots of things I think that when people set up a business, they don't understand um, or know about, but the process is probably one of the major things that can certainly streamline things. And as you say, really help give your couples or your, your brides in your instance, the, the confidence in what you're doing. Um, yeah. That's really interesting to, to hear. On that note, you, you know, you mentioned the hard work it takes to run a, a business, particularly one like yours. How have you got the balance right over the years? What with, I would imagine, late night, you know, late evening appointments, weekends. How have you got the balance between work and your personal life? Um, I have to say that my work-life balance is a constant um, challenge for me. Um, I'm a lot better at it now than I have have been because you know when you open a business, you absolutely give it your all because you a, you love it and you don't want to go home at night when you've got this beautiful environment and you do work hard. But you know, I guess corporate life taught me that the harder you work in a shorter period of time, the sooner you burn out and therefore you're no good to anybody. So I've always been quite good at that. Um, I you know I'm. My teams are employed to work a certain amount of hours. If they do, you know, more than 44 hours in one week, then they work 36 hours the following week. You know, they manage their hours. And I recognize we've all got families. We don't work every weekend. Um, so we, we try and get a real balance of life. But at the end of the day, Damien, you know this industry, you know, sleepy times, November, December, January, February, the minute March happens, it's flat out so people often say to me oh god ellie you know how on earth do you get any time off well i don't work in december i always take a month off work um and i often take half of february off so i i i do big take big chunks of holiday just to keep my sanity and keep my balance it means means that i'm fresh yeah. and clean and motivated for my team and my brain's not full of stuff so yeah, I kind of try and manage my work-life balance like that, but it is a constant source of challenge because it, it does get out of kilter in the summer months, as you know. I'm glad to hear you're clean. That's also, that's very important. Yes. <laughs> I think my brain is clean. <laughs> I'm not clogged up with worries. No, I'm with you. I hear you. It's, you're right. And, and I've sanitised my hands before the call. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say it because you're absolutely right. You have to have a balance because... If your couple or your brides, I keep saying couples because it generally is for people, but for you it's the brides, yeah. if they detect a hint of fatigue and for like, oh, going through the motions, then that's not the right sales environment for you or for them. You know, mm. so you, I can absolutely see you have to give yourself some time away to refresh mm. and to cleanse and then to, to come back so you're ready for, 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 for life in a busy in retail environment like you are. So it makes sense to me and it's interesting to hear. And I think, I think a lot of people in our industry don't get that balance right. Um, no. or don't know how to and, and that's that comes with experience right i'm sure yeah. um yeah. well we obviously so far we haven't mentioned the elephant in the room which is <laughs> our situation situation in which we all find ourselves affecting every aspect of our lives coronavirus and covid19 is a huge change to everybody in everything but i'm interested in how it's affecting you as a business owner as a business owner in the wedding industry and what changes you're having to make to your business to to, to live in the new normal yeah I, I mean, I, first of all, I think you would agree with me here. Huge sadness for all those brides and grooms that have had to postpone their wedding. It's just a horrible, unprecedented times and my heart breaks for them. Um, it's just it's just horrible. Um, but, you know, the good news is when their wedding happens, everybody that they want hopefully will be there and it'll be a positive situation and we can all move forward. But things have changed and they, they, they need to change. Um, we 
we, as I said to you at the beginning, we're not a wedding factory. We never have been. Um, and we only ever see one bride at a time. But we are now having to see less brides on a on a day because we're having to put cleaning time in between appointments um we're having to put in you know all the key covid secure policies to make sure that when you come into either of my studios that you feel comfortable that you're in a safe environment so things for me today today the reason i'm in the shop is we've just had staff training on covid secure so when a bride um, books an appointment with me she'll get a set of protocols that explain to her what's going to happen when she comes to the shop so when she comes to the shop um we will take temperatures we will have um, hand sanitation sport points throughout the shop that she keeps cleaning her hands. Um, there'll be beautiful pink spots on the floor where we'll stand and where the bride will stand and, and the consultation will carry on as normal. Um, we won't be under two meters at this point, but when we do get under two meters, then we will mask up and, um, and we'll ask the bride to do the same. So, the, the, the thing for me, Damien, is there's so many unanswered questions out there with COVID-19 about, um, you know, should you wear masks? Should you wear gloves? Should you do this? And I've spent three months researching all this and, and, and concluded the safe things in line with what the government is saying that we're going to put in place. And, you know, cleaning our hands. We worked out today during our mock-up consultation that we'd actually asked the bride in her dress, the pretend bride, to clean her hands 16 times during the consultation. I am very happy with that. So we have a process when they come in, you know, when they go into the fitting room, they clean their hands. When they come out, they clean their hands. So even when they touch the dresses, I know it's with clean hands. So those processes are all in place. I'm very happy that we will be cleaner than any supermarket you go food shopping in, no question. How has the coronavirus situation affected your supply chain? Has it affected it at all? Most of my dresses are British made, but all of the fabrics are not made in the UK. That's a fact, we don't make fabric anymore. So even if you make a dress in Britain, you've got to buy your fabric from Europe. Europe's been shut for business for three months. Most of my supply, in fact, all of my suppliers, we all saw this coming in February. Um, we were all making you know, provisions for what was about to happen. So most of my suppliers have got a bit of a backstock of fabric. But all of that said, you know, Europe has not been producing fabric for three months because it's not produced fabric for three months. We could be in short supply in the future. And so what we're saying to our brides is that if you try on a wedding dress and you absolutely love it, don't come back to me in six months and say, you know, the dress I tried on in June, well, I'd really like to buy it now because the chances are, you know, we won't be able to supply it. So it's either going to be a supply problem with fabric. But the big, big thing, and people don't often think about this one, Damien, is when you order a handmade wedding dress, it is made by hand. We don't call it handmade for that, you know, for no reason. It's made by hand. And so there is a real person makes your dress. So let's say for ease, Suzanne Neville makes a thousand wedding dresses a year. So 2021, she makes a thousand. 2020 she makes a thousand if 500 of the 2020 brides don't get married in 2020 and bump their wedding into 2021 suzanne neville can still only make a thousand wedding dresses so now we've got 1500 brides that want wedding dresses but there's only capacity to make a thousand so it's not just a supply chain issue with fabric it's a supply chain issue with production, as in making dresses. So, you know, brides that are already getting planned for weddings in 2021 are there, but the overflow will tip into next year. And everybody needs to be aware of that because we can't absorb it all. It won't all go. You know, a pint won't go into a quart pot. So things are going to have to be spread out across the year. And if you find your wedding dress, make a decision, don't hang around. Because if you hang around, you run the risk of A, not getting in a production cycle or B, not having full choice of fabrics. So does that affect the lead time for a bride buying her dress or does it simply uh, impact the decision making process? So you find a dress, you like it, buy it sooner rather than later, rather than yeah. it will take longer to get. Is that, is that how that works? Yeah. That yeah, because if you if you came into the shop today and bought your dress today, then your dress is safe. I can order it. It will go on the production line. Suzanne Neville will say, OK, we've sold 
um, Ellie sold this dress, we need this amount of um, uh, Mikado for this bride, and let's get that Mikado made, and production is there, and production is guaranteed to make this dress up. So all the key components, buttons, linings, interlinings, zippers, fabric, elastic, all the stuff that goes into making that dress is all ordered with all the various people, it's all delivered in, and then there is a production slot saved for that bride. If the bride doesn't book the dress and take up that production slot, and then she comes back with the, you know nine months to go, the production slot will have gone, and if it's gone, it's gone. It's gonna be a tough one, Damien, because people yeah. will think that we are making it up as a sales pitch, but you know, I, I will stand and look people in the eye, and I will be honest with them. If the, if the fabric's not an issue, then I'll say this fabric's going to be fine or you know this dress is made you know in New York and I know that that's going to be fine because the production cycle is okay there but actually if it's not fine I'll tell you it's not fine because I want people to make informed decisions. So I want to take you back a few years now Ellie and uh, to back to your your early days of your involvement with the wedding industry awards and let's just ask you what it was in in those early days that attracted you to the wedding industry awards yeah i mean i i i won the award in 2012 so eight years ago um and i remember at the time um looking at various awards that were out there and think people were saying oh why don't you put your name in the hat for this and i'm like no 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 because i always felt they were a little bit loaded um you know magazine awards you would win a magazine award if you were paying for magazine space to advertise and i just didn't agree with it um, and then along came the Wedding Industry Awards and Damien Bailey and Anna Bailey and I'm like, wow, this looks a bit different. These guys are independent. What are they getting out of this? Which magazine supports them? You know, what's special about, about this? Um, and I just loved the fact that you were not um, a magazine, that you weren't a publisher you, and, and, and that you were a, a, a brilliant wedding photographer who decided that something had to be set up that was independent and and judged effectively and i just loved that i loved that and that award was one of my proudest awards because i, I got it i won it because it was based on what my customers were saying and what the judges and how the judges had judged me and and i i, I hold it very dear um and that added massive credibility to my business because um not only um, did I win an, an award like this but I got all the feedback from my customers and what they were saying and I have that in a book and I have that book in my shops and customers read it when they come in and we use quotes on the website from it um, and so it was phenomenal it, it gave it gave me I was a very young business then I was only three three years old, four years old. And it added a massive credibility to my business. So, you know, people saw that I had the little, you know, TWIA award and it added credibility. No question, no question. You've been in business for a while now and you must have come across many challenges. Um, can you think of any in particular that, that have been particularly sort of tricky for you and how you dealt with them? I want to try to help others in this, in this situation at the moment Think of ways in which they can work around it, work through it to push and drive their business beyond it. Uh, so they'd, I'm sure they'd love to hear some inspirational advice from you as to how they can drive their business through those challenges. I never start a financial year without a business plan because I think, you know, you don't get in your car and head off on a journey and you don't know where you're going. So it's exactly the same with the business plan. And that's probably my corporate background. But, you know, I think it's important to sit down at the beginning of the year and say, right, these are my fixed costs. I know what I have to have to pay every year. You know, these are the potential. These are my potential target sales. What are my sales? Um, what am I? What do I want to achieve? in money, money wise, and therefore bottom line profit. And then the very simple question of five, five things. How am I going to do it? How am I going to make that happen? What are the key things that I'm going to work on? Is it going to be my social media presence? Is it going to be the development of my website and maybe um, an online booking system? Am I going to review all of my customer database information and how I use it? Am I going to, you know, what, what are the key things that are important to you? Because I think I'm always a big fan of, you, you know, you always get back what you measure. And if you're not measuring things, you don't get, you don't get the results. Um, being a retailer, the other thing that I have to look at 
is investment in product because if I haven't got the most up-to-date product, then I'm not going to attract my right date client base but I never overspend myself and I always measure I, there's always a return on investment done on anything so if I buy a collection and I spend ten thousand pound on that collection I have a certain amount of return that I expect from that and so another thing that I do is not I don't just review uh, my business plan I also review my staff every year I always have staff appraisals sit down let's have a conversation this is how I think you're, you're doing how do you feel you're doing here are your results, because we measure everybody's results. This is how many dresses you sold last quarter. Um, you know, it's great, fantastic, could have been better, whatever. But I always believe in just being open and, and, and whatever. But everything has, to, for me, everything has to be measured. You have to measure it. And if you're not measuring it, you, you have no idea where you're going. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, Ellie, what would yeah. it be? Ooh. I should have married George Clooney, shouldn't I? <laughs> oh, there is that. That would be excellent advice. Um, I give myself a yeah, younger self. I was always, I, when I was younger, I was very hot-headed and driven and determined. And I didn't have as much humility as I've developed in the last 10 years of my life. So if I could go back to 20, I think that's what I would do. But then the big question I ask myself is if I had done that, would I have achieved what I achieved and would I be where I am today? Who knows? But yeah, humility, I, I think we all have to act with humility in every situation um, and not necessarily jump to the conclusion that people are you know, taking you for a ride or not being positive or not looking after your, your best interests. I think humility is something that we can all learn a bit more from. Yeah, it's good advice. I think you're right. And, and that's uh, the dangers of youth, isn't it? When we're all getting on a bit now and, and, and the, un the knowledge, the understanding of that need for some humility is there. Whereas when you're younger and you're, you're driving and you're ambitious, as you say, you may, may not have it. So yes, sound advice, I think, for every, anyone out there. I've got another one. Vulnerability. Always good to admit a little bit of vulnerability. Yeah, none of us are infallible, that's for sure. I know, because I don't think often we, we do that. And even, even as confident as I am in my business, I've felt very vulnerable in the last three months. Yeah, I'm admitting vulnerability. I've felt very vulnerable. And I think it's important always to be honest with, about, with, with vulnerability. It's quite endearing when somebody that you see as Teflon coated and strong and blah actually says, I'm feeling vulnerable here. I'm really not comfortable with what's going on. So yeah, humility and vulnerability, I would have given myself at 20 so finally, um, Ellie, I'm, I want to look forward to 2021 and beyond. Yeah. I want to understand what you think wedding business owners should be looking, doing and focusing on to help bring their businesses through this uh, kind of situation and drive it into the future to make it grow and improve it. Yeah, I think, I think, Damien, we've had three months of restart that none of us would ever have at this time of year. And so if people haven't already made some big changes, I'd be worried. <laughs> you know, I've spent, I've spent months doing webinars, upskilling myself on all sorts of different things. So that's been an amazing thing to do. I think now what we need to focus on 150% is we've got to communicate one, you know, just so closely with all of our suppliers. We've got to keep everybody tight and close um, because only the fit will survive the next six months. Cause it's, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. We may be open, I may have a diary that's full to the end of July, but if people don't buy dresses off me in the next eight weeks, I'm going to have another bigger challenge on my hands. So I think we need to keep close with our suppliers. I think we need to keep very close with our customers um, so that we're sensing the, 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 the mood of what's going on. You know, are girls going to commit to buying wedding dresses? Are girls going to book wedding venues if they haven't been to them? Are girls going to book a photographer, somebody to make their cake or their flowers if they haven't got everything out, all their other ducks in a row? And so I think it's really important to be accessible um, and, and open and, you know, if your social media channels aren't what they should be, they need to be. You've got to be open all hours at the moment um, for conversations and chat. So, you know, close to your suppliers, close to your consumers and close to your people, close to your staff. I've got a, you know, I've got seven girls that work with me. We all need to be on the same page. We all need to be working together. 
we all need to be you know passing the hygienically clean baton um, and making sure that we're all running in the same direction everybody's suffering the industry is suffering but also everyone else's industries are stuff are suffering as well and i think driving businesses through being quite bullish about it promoting yourself marketing yourself whether that's on social media or you know entering awards or whatever else that might be it's it's about putting your hand up and and getting yourself out there promoting yourself yeah. so I think you're right if people haven't made those changes if they needed to then they're going to need to pretty soon um the good thing about the wedding industry though i think is that it's business delayed rather than business lost in the main um couples still want to get married it's just a question of when so we we feel pretty buoyant about the industry in that regard and yeah. certainly anecdotally from the research that we've done over the last few months others are sharing that too pain at the moment but positivity going forward so yeah. fingers crossed and also we just hope that we get back to uh be able to run our events in november or, or yeah. early next year because i think by then apart from anything else we'll all just need a really good knees up some you know somewhere <laughs> hand out some trophies, get the yep. champagne flowing and, and reconnect with each other because we're an industry that likes to do that. So we just hope we can do that. Um, uh, we'll see. We'll see. And celebrate success. You know, we've got to celebrate success because if we all get through this and we, and we get to November and we are successful and we've survived, then we've got to celebrate that 150%. I agree. I agree. Well, fingers crossed we'll be able to do that. I hope so. Ellie, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely okay. fascinating talking to you and I know all the people watching this will, will find it interesting and useful too. I wish you all the best for your grand reopening and all those lovely brides coming through your doors buying dresses um, and good luck for the rest of this year and going forwards. Thank you so much for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Damien. Good to see you.